May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. This week's gospel passage is about, you guessed it, bread. What was last week's gospel passage about? Bread. bread. What was the gospel passage about the week before that? Bread. And the week before that? Bread. bread. So if you didn't get the message, it's about bread. But is it really about bread? Is it really about bread? Carol's shaking her head. No. What Jesus is doing here is taking one of the most common elements of life, right? Bread is the staff of life necessary for survival, and he's reinterpreting it. And he's saying something about himself and something about us. Now, I was telling the group that gathered yesterday for a little service that when I was a little boy, I watched a public television show called The Electric Company. Does anybody remember that? Yes, it came on after or before Sesame Street. And my favorite segment was when there were four boxes on the TV, and the game was one of these things is not like the other. Does anyone remember that? And there would be like three boys jumping rope, and maybe one girl bouncing a ball, and you had to identify which was not like the other. Well, the same is true of the Gospels. So this is a little bit of biblical context here for all of you, a little bit of Bible study in the midst of the sermon. So there are four Gospels. Can anybody name them? Matthew, Matthew Mark, Luke, and John. Yes. And one of these four is not like the other. Does anybody know which one it is? John. John is not like the others. The other Gospels are sometimes called the synoptic Gospel, from a Greek word, S-Y-N means together, and optic, like eye, means seeing. So the synoptic Gospels see together. They all have the same source material. But John was written later for a different community, and even in the early church and in the early medieval period, they knew that John was a little different, a little weird, and they called it the mystical gospel, the mystical gospel. So in John's gospel, Jesus is always talking in this mystical, symbolic, poetic, allegorical language. And that is the way to understand it. You get into trouble when you literalize it. So when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, what is Jesus talking about? Does he mean that he is really bread? If I write a poem to Kathy and I say, my love is like a red, red rose. I am a red, red rose. Do I mean that I am a red, red rose? No, I'm trying to conv convey something symbolically. So what is Jesus trying to convey? Yes, he's trying to convey something about him that is eternal and in some way allows us to tap into that, okay? So he says last week, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And he says even more scand scandalously this week, what? Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Is Christianity a cannibalistic religion? No, no. But it certainly might seem like it. And in fact, the Jews when he said this, were totally scandalized because one of the key prohibitions in Judaism is you never eat blood. Does anybody have friends who maybe are Orthodox Jews? You cannot eat blood because blood represents the life force and the life force belongs to God. So when Jesus says this in his time, it is totally, totally scandalous. So what does Jesus really mean when he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood? Some of you have the answer because you were here yesterday. So feel free to raise your hand. 
Carolyn, Laurel, go ahead. Yeah, he's kind of talking about soul or spirit or maybe what contemporary people might say is energy. But the word that I like best, and this is actually a theological word, is presence. The presence of Jesus. Where does it dwell? How do we abide in it? And what Jesus is saying is, I'm not offering you a philosophical discourse on some theological concept that I want you to think about, argue about, and debate about. No. He's saying, I want you to eat it. I want you to digest it. I want you to live it so that it permeates you at the deepest cellular levels of your being. And what is that energy, spirit, or presence? Betsy got it. It's love. We basically come to church every single Sunday so that we can remember what is at the center of the universe and how can we participate in it? That's what Jesus is saying. And he's saying, you've got to eat it. You've got to chew it. You've got to digest it. It has to become part of you so that you are nothing other than love, so that you can't help but to love. So of course I'm going to read Richard Rohr. And this is what he has to say about the real presence of Jesus. He says, all my life, I have held the belief that the real presence of Christ is communicated in the bread and wine of the sacred meal, rather shockingly taught by Jesus in John chapter 6. This is not a magical idea but simply the mystery of incarnation taken to its logical co conclusion, from creation itself uniquely to Jesus' body, to the human body of Christ that we all are, and then to the very elements from the earth and human hands like bread and wine. The very notion is inherently and necessarily relational and embodied. Note that Jesus did not say, think about this, prove this, look at this, carry this around, and surely not argue about this. He just said, eat this. As St. Augustine would preach later, the message is that you are what you eat. In the Eucharist, we move beyond mere words or rational thought and go to that place where we don't talk about the mystery. We begin to chew on it. We must move our knowing to the bodily, cellular, participative, and unitive level. Then we keep eating and drinking the mystery until one day it dawns on us in an undefended moment. My God, I really am what I eat. We are the very body of Christ. We have dignity and power flowing through us in our naked existence, and everybody else does too, even though most of us do not know it. This is enough to guide and empower our entire faith journey. I was saying yesterday that one of my mentors was a nun of the Community of the Holy Spirit, which began in New York City, and I think, Carolyn, you attended a school that the nuns wrote, uh, ran. Um, I guess at one point, maybe they got, they got tired <laughs> of running the school, and they started a farm in Brewster, New York. They had both. Actually. They did have both. I think... So, so the school I attended was founded in the late 1950s. Okay.
yes, yes. So you were taught by nuns, Carolyn. That explains it all, right? <laughs> I, I, want, I want to warn everyone here who thinks that we understand what that means. A Sistine nuns are truly vastly Well, they were, yes. And I do think they did get a little tired of teaching, to be honest with you, some of the um, conversations I had with them. And so they started this farm in what was then a rural campus. And I think it's called Bluestone Farm. And Sister Catherine Grace would tell me all the time, the entire universe is Eucharistic. The entire universe is Eucharistic. What did she mean by that? What do you think she might have meant by that? Anyone? All tied back to Christ. All tied back to Christ, but she was also talking about sort of the giving and taking that is part of existence. There is a flow of energy that is part of life. And I'm so glad that Gary chose, without my telling him, verse four of that opening hymn, verse four. There is a line at the very end that says something like, Jesus, both priest and victim, in the Eucharistic feast. I want to dwell on that just for a moment. Priest and victim in the Eucharistic feast. Does anybody have any idea what that line might mean? It is very profound. Well, let's go maybe to what a priest is. Teacher, complaint department. <laughs> what else? Leader. Does anyone know what the original role of a priest was in ancient Israelite religion? Go out on a limb, you'll probably be close. Teacher of mysteries, and it was actually a mystery that was in some ways really basic. The priest was the butcher. The priest was the one that offered the sacrifice, that sacrificed the cow or the sheep or whatever it was in hopes of some kind of offering and maybe atonement becoming one with God through sacrifice. So the priest was the one who sacrificed, right? And the reason why in the Episcopal Church and the Roman Catholic Church we call the priest the priest is because we believe that there's some kind of sacrifice that the priest is engaging in, whether it's at the altar or a sacrifice of time and talent, there's some sacrifice that is taking place that is bringing God's people together with God. Okay, so that's priest. So when it says there, Jesus, Jesus both priest and victim, what does that mean? Exactly, exactly. Jesus is saying yes to the Eucharistic feast of life, that there is a giving and there is a taking, there is an offering, there's a being sacrificed. And Jesus is saying yes to it. So this is true of life and death, we know, right? I mean, we're at the top of the food chain, so usually we don't realize it. But we all know deep down that we're all <laughs> going to be pushing up daisies and we're going to be food for worms. That's the Eucharistic feast of life. And Jesus, a keen observer of the natural world, knew that whatever is true physically is true even more spiritually even more spiritually. And what is at the heart of the universe is love. And what Jesus is saying and doing is he's basically offering himself in loving sacrifice. That's what it means to participate in the Eucharist, in the Eucharistic feast, that we offer ourselves in loving sacrifice as part of the cycle of love that goes around and around. 
So love sometimes doesn't always get immediately returned, right? That's part of what it means to be Christian and the countercultural thing that Jesus is saying, that you will participate in this cycle of love, but it might not immediately come back to you. So I was thinking about this the other day, and I was thinking about how many times in all of my series of dating relationships, I have heard the line, I'm not feeling it. I remember 10 years ago, being on a very romantic dinner date with someone whose name will not be mentioned, but it rhymes with John, actually. And we came back from this romantic dinner date to his apartment, and he said to me, I'm not feeling it. And I, of course, left the apartment in tears. I probably sobbed daily for at least a month, if not more. You can ask my mother to verify. And I wish I could say that I hadn't heard that line since. I'm not feeling it. But the sad truth is I've heard it many times since. And the good news is that I haven't cried maybe for a month though I still cry, but because of chewing on Jesus, I'm able to say, you may not be feeling it, but I'm choosing it. I am choosing to love. And that's what we're doing in the Eucharist, in church, every time we gather. We are saying yes to love, that you are the body of Christ. You cast out fear with love, and you give life to the world. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.